Good evening, chess friends. Actually, it's evening for me. I hope it's afternoon for you. Um, this is International Master of Larry Wolf, and today we're going to be talking about some really interesting practical topics uh, for every chess player's preparation. But before that, I'd like to know if you guys can hear me all right and the sound is actually working. If it is working, please do let me know so that um, the sound, so that I know that the sound is actually right. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's see. This, okay, let's take a look. So, do, do, do you guys hear me? I hope that you do. All right. I don't see any, I don't hear anybody. I actually don't see anyone writing. Uh, is there any sound? Let's see. Checking up because there have been some problems with the sound the past time, and I want to know that everybody is able to hear me okay. Please confirm on the chat that it's working. Yes, you hear. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for confirming. That's good. So, what are we going to be talking about today? Now, today we're going to be talking about quite a few things, but more importantly, we're going to talk about Grandmaster Sam Shanklin's way of actually explaining how we can think about strategy. And essentially, I'm going to show you some really interesting highlights that was, were impressive to me and the way I learned them from his brilliant 15-hour course that he has recently released. Um, so essentially, we're going to begin with a few games that he's presented in his scores, and my view on those games and the things that I were able, uh, I was able to learn, and I hope that you will share some of my uh, thoughts and ideas on um, how these games worked and what's so instructive about them. So I'm going to begin with the very first game. So I'm going to load it up right now. Just a second. Yeah. Okay, so the first game we're going to be by the great positional master Vladimir Kramnik. Now, a lot of people say that Kramnik plays boring in positional chess, but whoever says that doesn't actually realize that Kramnik's way of playing is essentially very, very tactical. It's just that he's able to put in this positional display that makes him look very slow and boring. So. There is a lot of value in his games, and in particular, I'm going to bring up that one game that I want to introduce to you. So, here we go. <coughs> Just give me one second. Now, the game was played between Vladimir Kramnik and Levon Aronian in 2012 Chess Olympiad. And this was a pretty amazing game, in my opinion. It shows what positional play is all about and how effectively it connects with the tactics. So Kramnik was playing white, and he basically started the game with d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, and knight f6. Now, as the game started, basically white did the exchange in the d5, and then after the exchange and the recapture, sorry, actually black played with e6, I'm sorry. See, you see a c6, knight c3, knight f6 exchange and recapture. We get into what a lot of people consider very boring, the semi-slav exchange. Now, I've always said that no matter what the opening is, as long as it fits the right positional laws, like making sure we have the good control of the center, the easy command of development, and so on and so forth, almost any opening could work out just as well. And so White did it pretty well with bishop f4, e3, and bishop d3. He sets up the development into pieces the way they need to be. So g6 and h3. Now, there's nothing so interesting so far until that moment. The really interesting part of the game begins after Black's next move, which was bishop to f5. And here comes my first question to you guys, which is really... What should white do? This is very interesting because black's intention is to exchange the bishops and essentially simplify the game 
which would be quite all right. However, our job is to figure out if we should let him to exchange it, retreat, or exchange on our own. So this is my first question to you. Let's see what you think about it. And I'll appreciate if you comment on your suggestion, not just to tell me the move, because apparently the move is pretty clear. One of the three, retreat, keep it, or exchange. I want to hear your reasoning. In fact, actually, I want to, I want to read your reasoning. So that would help. Um, Please let me know about that on the on the chat. Now, not, do not take Queen C2. Okay, I appreciate your suggestion, although Queen C2 may be a problem due to Knight B4, so we don't want to do that. Retreating, okay, the retreat is not as perfect, to be honest with you. Even though you might want to do it, oftentimes when you get to retreat, you lose quite a bit of the initiative. And especially in the opening, you just don't want to do it. Can we make a move like knight of three? Yes. And we can also think about the exchange. But um, how do you decide between those two? Now, here's a little think about exchanges. When it comes down to an actual exchange, I think the first question you got to ask yourself is, how does that impact my position in a negative way? Oftentimes, you will very easily notice the benefits of the exchange. But the negatives of it often remain unseen, and people lose because of that. The problem with the move of bishop takes f5, g takes f, even though we create double pawns and it looks pretty effective against this black, black king side, in fact gives him plenty of good chances. After knight f3, we see the main negative inside white's position that will be the fact that black can play e6 and follow that through with bishop to the d6. While you're thinking that initially black's king side would look, for castling would look very bad, I'm here to tell you that once the king gets to safety, he can put his rook right back in and he can apply plenty of pressure against the g2. So this would become fairly unpleasant. See, I think that an exchange is only as good as the negatives that it actually you know brings if if you believe that the negatives are going to be too many or they're going to be like quite bad like the open g line that he's going to get for attack and the solid pawns for spawn chain i think you shouldn't exchange and that's exactly what white picked up to do he decided not to do it he decided to play knight f3 so after the, as a result of the trade and d3 white could retake with the queen and he can feel comfortable enough with his idea of castling and starting up an actual plan. See, this was a very important. Now, let me let me bring a couple of you. Exchange, break up the Black King set pawn structure. Only on the surface, you will. You see, the long-term impact of the exchange was better for him. Now, Bishop E2 was a passive move, as I mentioned. So this, I'm just reading through the comments. A3, it didn't need to happen. That was an unimportant move. Why just focused on developing? So now we have another uh, pretty instructive position. I mean, white is doing fairly well. Everything looks good. We have a solid position. So what to do from here? I'm going to give you a second to think about it. And while you're thinking about that, and let's see if you can guess Kramnik's brilliant plan here, uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, right below the video, there is a link to Grandmaster Sam Shanklin. He's a Grandmaster, but one of the most famous Grandmasters in the U.S. Uh, he's rated more than 2,600, but he's prepared a 16-hour new course that brings out the little secrets that all of the great champions like Kramnik, Morozovic, Topolov, and even himself, in fact, use in their games. And what's so interesting about it is that he sets up to explain a lot about how do you create these advantages, possibilities, and, and what you can do so you can actually get borrow a little bit of that magic and bring it into your into your game so it, it goes to the fantastic 50 percent off for just the next few hours so if you want to get it it's right beneath the, the video i'm also going to put a, a link in the chat so you might want to actually consider that so rook fc1 is good absolutely this is a beautiful way to go and it's most important because it improves now what i often like to say is that when you plan 
it's never about where, how, what, and so on and so forth. It's about really one thing. What is the goal? And the goal now for White is to just make sure his pieces are better. We're not ready to attack. There's no target. And we, we have already almost completed our development. So from this point on, Kramnik sets up to achieve this goal by making every single piece walk towards a more advanced place. The rook on the c1, the knight on the a4, the knight goes by the c5, and then the rook even takes on there. It's beautiful to see how these pieces work together. And uh, that's about it. Okay, so and so after the move of uh, uh, knight exchange takes, black played queen d7 and then white played rook c1. Now one of you just said, I just joined and what is this video about? Um, the lecture today is um, basically like a, s a small interpretation of my learning from, gr from, from Grandmaster Shank Shanklin's recent course on Grandmaster Secrets. So I'm going to show a few of his of the games from his course and the way I learned from them, the things that I learned most importantly, but you could still take a look at his course and I think it's great. So anyway, white played rook a c1, black played rook c8, and from this point on, Y just gets to build. I like to use very recently, you know, like I, I came up with a very interesting explanation to uh, that I, I teach to kids about this type of play because you know most kids they're used to all right let's attack let's go tactics and i tell them you know instead of thinking like that you know where where he can attack or what you can target imagine you have a large lego that you have lost the manual to so you don't have the models and what you need to do is you have to figure out the models yourself and so you have these all these blocks that you have to build and yet you have to use your imagination to do it one step at, uh, at a time as you go along. That's what improvement often means. You take this improvement with moves like rook c1, a3, you know, knight a4 as we played and so on and so forth and you grow it and you gain that momentum without actually seeing the final picture. It's pretty important to do it like that and it's actually easy as long as you have the patience. So black played rook bishop f8, and then what white did was rook c2, just taking that rook to a safe position. Now, two things happen when you do this. First of all, you gain enough time so you can figure out when or how to begin your actual attack. But the second most important thing, you let your opponent to mess it up. This was a thing that my dad used to teach me when I was younger. He used to say, when you play against uh, your opponents, like who are weaker than you, said, let them mess it up. And it really remained in my mind as a concept that if I let my opponent mess it up, I'm going to have a great chance of winning instead of pushing the position and risking myself. So then I started, okay, let's play a little more slowly, still with it and the idea to attack and take the initiative, but a little more gradually, giving him no clue of where I'm going to start and yet, when I get to build up, he is going to make a lot of weaknesses. And, and Black did make the weaknesses. This is not just happening in the games of beginner or intermediate players. A lot of strong players tend to make those mistakes. Like Black did f6 now, already weakening quite a bit of his king's position. So I want you to think again and try to provide the best suggestion on how White can advance right now. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to answer a few of the questions that you've or comments that you guys put in. I encourage you to bring in as many comments as you can or questions, whatever is unclear, bring it on the chat. It's uh, beneath the video as well. What is this opening? It's the Slav. It's the Slav exchange. Yes. The B4 and B5 as a plan is a good idea, although we have to do it carefully because if we do it so fast, it's just going to lead to many exchanges. So if you if you go by the position, the knight on f3 is probably more important to activate than uh, the expansion, I suppose. That's true. b4 or h4. I think that one of you just mentioned the perfect idea. Expansion is good, but only as long as it can, it's going to create threats. And we don't have any of those just yet, unfortunately. So in that regard, in that respect, 
it's going to be best if we start with the pieces. Knight d2. Remember what I said to you. Don't rush to position true. Give yourself a little time to build it, like knight d2 did. It was a nice move, taking the opportunity to get that knight around the queen side. And, and I know what some of you are thinking. Like some of you are going to be fine. Like, all right, this is fine. I can do this. And I can think a little more about those moves. But the other part of you will be like, you know, just even subconsciously, some of you are going to be thinking, okay, come on. This is the sort of boring kind of bullshit that I, I, I know about. I don't want to play like that. I want to just sacrifice my queen and checkmate the opponent. And while that kind of approach sounds exciting, it's very unrealistic, you know? You have to understand that even in some of the games of great players like Tal and Fisher, who are very famous for their ability to attack, a lot of times what you see in the books is the end stage, the final stage of what we call a long-term buildup. And that's what chess is. Chess is a game of plans. If you want something faster and more exciting, then you look for another sport. But chess is really much more about planning. It's, it's an intellectual game. It's basically defeating your opponent by thinking, by analyzing the position a lot better, not by just making the more exciting moves in the play. And so basically after the move of um, knight b3 as it was, you can see how white's position progressively improves and it becomes more and more important as he grows and gets his pieces better. So black now plays rook to c8, and, and this is an important situation. What to do now? Now, what if you just, okay, a couple of you asked uh, while you're thinking here, this game is similar to the Jacobian Vorsha, very instructive game. Look it up. Yeah, all right. Thank you. That's a, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. So can we go for the f3 and e4, similar to the Botvinnik plan? I think you could, although you have to be careful about the center, because maybe the d4 pawn could hang. Uh, that g3 would weaken a little too much. I don't think that it would weaken too much, I think. So, um, but we just want to do that move on purpose. I think we've already covered the h2 square, so not a problem. Now, what if you said, why not to build to, why doesn't black take the center with the support of f3? I suppose you mean for white, because you see, you got to choose where you're going to play. If you play on the center, that's fine. But if you play on the queen side, that's fine too. Just don't mix them up. You can push on both areas only once you already dominate on one of them. And if you dominate <clears throat> on, the, let's say, the queen side or the king side, then opening up towards the center would make a good sense. But I don't think we're dominating just yet. Not just yet. Not just yet. So let's see if anybody has a suggestion. Now, what if you said, are you sacrificing the knight on a5? Well, we are going to sacrifice the knight if he takes the next move. He's, that's what he wants to do. He wants to take our knight with this, uh, with his own. So he just covered, I mean, he was pinned before, so he defended the rook. And yeah, I think we gotta got to figure out what to do now. <clears throat> so anybody, does anybody have a good suggestion here? Rook c5 hangs a piece. Yes, it does. Yes, it does, because black will just take on a5, and we can't take back, unfortunately. Queen b3, same thing. a5 is going to hang. We can't do that either. I mean, you shouldn't, rather, do that. No, we can't do queen b3. Now, give me purpose. I don't want just moves. You could say queen b3 although it loses, or you could say anything, but I want to see the reason behind your suggestion so I can comment on that. Otherwise, I can comment on the fact that queen b3 loses the knight, but, um, you know, knight takes b7. Now, what the hell is that? Why would we like to just take the pawn on b7? What if he takes it with the rook? Knight b3. Yes, certainly. We can re remove that knight from the a5 and regroup it towards c5 but in some way the problem of this is that it's going to release the tension see black can make a move of e5 challenge us in the middle and i like that knight but it's not causing any trouble to black he can exchange us he can get the rook over here and i think this is going to be work so no mm -mm. now d4 is possible although he'll exchange it now let's get back 
to one of your guys suggestions in fact two of, of you recommended the idea of night takes to b7 and i love that idea this is wonderful not just an exchange but an actual sacrifice see when kramnik did that move it was incredibly scary at first because it almost felt like you made a mistake and yet you realize that his attack has become incredibly successful due to one thing, the pressure. When you are attacking, it is never about how the attack looks or how the challenges look. It's about could you keep your opponent longer in that backside position? Because the only difference between the successful and the unsuccessful sacrifices is in the length that you can hold your opponent in the time you hold your opponent at a bad defensive position. It's a very simple idea. Now, unless we're talking about a winning sacrifice, like you take and then you win immediately, that's a tactical sacrifice, yeah, which is obviously quite clear. Unless we're talking about that, sacrifice only works within the concept of keeping your opponent in the bad position for a little bit longer holding the pressure longer now why do i mean longer because everybody who makes a sacrifice gets the initiative you will hold him under pressure for two or three moves that's for sure but unless you can hold him for more than that or you can see a way for you to win after those two or three moves then you better don't sacrifice because it's not going to be right what white did in this position was beautiful because he played b4 going running for the b5 that was going to pin down the knight and then after queen b7, he found out this brilliant queen b6 move, which doesn't allow the black knight to move due to the three attackers against c7. And so what we realize right now isn't just the pressure itself. It is the fact that there is a continuation to it. There is a way to, con to, to figure out more challenges and more pressure over there. And so it gets out of the pin, but it doesn't get him out of the pressure so if you think about it there are only three goals of a successful attack we need to win you need to check me of course we want to win material or we want to keep the pressure if your attack does not lead to any of those three it's not good you are not doing it right or maybe it's not a real attack it just looks like a good attack but it's a it's a diversion so the reality is after queen d7, white just kept on the pressure. And then, of course, because when your opponent is just being constantly punched and he's kept in the same place, sooner or later, that means you're going to destroy him. And that's what happens now. Knight takes d4, rook takes to c7, uh, knight e2, king h1, knight takes to c1, rook takes c8, and then when black plays, queen takes to the c we just do queen c6 and it's kind of wonderful because he can't exchange it really on the other hand if he doesn't we just play b6 you may be wondering as as to why did black not exchange it and suddenly you realize he can't catch the pawn so it's uh it's wonderful this whole sequence is based on the pressure and the pressure itself leads to the inevitable attack of the knight and then we win the rook but more importantly we win the knight. Now black, of course, run. White gets to create a pass pawn. And as the king progresses, we just play a check here and queen a7. White didn't even care about the useless knight on c1. He just wanted to have that pawn go forward. And uh, uh, what, what I really love about this position, is, about this game, is how white did it. I mean, starting from the very beginning, it began, it began as, as an unimpressive type of sequence of development that a lot of people would say, okay, so why would I care about this? Shouldn't I fight for more? Certainly, there are openings that look like they fight for more. But in reality, as long as you have the right base, like good center, fast development, you're good to go. So the first really important moment was the idea for why not to exchange the choice. That exchanging is a bad idea because it was first too early and secondly the negatives 
are more important than the positives we're going to get from it. So why did not want to engage so, so early in the game? Secondly, the idea of the plan. So the major activity that White took was really not with an idea, with a concept of attacking or anything. It was just with the concept of, okay, can I take my pieces and make them better? Think of a goal. Forget all the other th concepts. What's my goal? The goal was just to move forward and advance on the queen side to, to, to carry it on. And the most important thing is just basically to keep building towards that. Like this is the little Lego, as I mentioned, you know, that you're setting up and walking towards that and, and just, just keeping it forward. In the end, it is going to transform. But you have to keep working through that. Knight takes to b7 is a transformation. Uh, you cannot know that from the beginning when you start. But in the end of the day, when it comes down to a move like this, even if it's a little risky, as long as you feel like the pressure is going to be there for longer, you can go for it. Yes, there is always a bit of a risk. Pressure is the indicator to show you whether you're 80% right or maybe you're 80% wrong. So, um, Let's see. Now I've got a couple of questions. Um, so, like one of you, one of you asked if it was risky for us, so we cannot do this type of sacrifice. When you say that, you restrict, you limit yourself. You know, there's this very old saying by uh, Grandmaster Savelli Tartakover. Tartakover um, used to have these. Uh, in my local tongue, we we call them Tartakoverisms. The Tartakoverisms were some very interesting pieces of wisdom. And one of them was say, saying, uh, you know, the player who sacrifices risks to lose, but the player who doesn't will always lose. And the reason for that is because when you risk, you learn. Even if it doesn't work, you learn. And essentially, when you know how to evaluate it, the risk is less. So you have to do that. Uh, so yeah, and, and this was a positional type of combination. It wasn't necessarily tactical. It wasn't winning in one of these two, those two moves. So um, yeah, now um, yeah, like this was a really great example from Shanklin's scores actually, and I do recommend you to check it out. Once again, it's uh, take a look at his scores. It's fifty percent off right beneath the video. I'll put a link on the chat so you can check it out. Now I want to show you one more game actually from his scores that was pretty impressive at least to me. Um, so just give me one second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy it. By the way, for any of you who want me to send you this, uh, this game with my annotations and with the, so with, with the notes and everything, uh, I do recommend you to just write me an email. You can send me an email. I'll send you the file after the, uh, the webinar. You can uh, send me an email to, I'm just going to put my email on, larry.lilov at gmail.com. Or just just visit my uh, website contact page. You can instantly just send me a send me a message from there, and I will be glad to send you back the file, so you can uh, you know put in your notes and all the key learning points from today. I I'm all for the notes, especially when you get to rewind that kind of thing. It's good to take some notes and and learn from them. So, okay, hold on for a second. I'm going to. Bring in the second game that I've prepared for today. Okay. So, let's take a look at a game that was played by Personally, in my opinion, the strongest players in the world right now. And he was the strongest player in the world and since 1985, or even since earlier. It's Gary Kasparov. Now, I think as Kasparov is back, he is going to defeat everyone. I still believe that he is the best player in the world, even though he's retired. But uh, what's so interesting is that in this next game, I'm going to show you, Kasparov had an incredible sequence. And that's just worth discussing, worth looking at. Here we go. Name was Gary Kasparov, Judith Polger, played in the Eurotel Trophy in 2002. Now, essentially the game was very instructive because of how it started. White played e4, c5, knight f3, d6, and bishop b5 check. 
And as you will see, in reality, White did something amazing that most chess players don't ever do when they play openings. Now, I've made some the webinars on the openings, but people still find it very confusing to understand what I mean by the concept of structure. Now, structure is very interesting. When it comes down to structure, all you care about is how you put your pawns in relation to your pieces and how does that turn out be more successful. It doesn't require any special skills, nor it requires a huge amount of theoretical knowledge. All it requires is a little bit of imagination instead of just following developing moves to think about it like that. Like what White wanted to do right now is to exchange saying, I can double the pawns, I will speed my development up, and I can focus on controlling the center, thereby neutralizing or restricting the black bishops. You see, it saves you so much time from useless, like, opening book knowledge. In any case, I mean, of course, I'm not against studying openings. It's just that this, I think that learning how to think in the opening is a lot more important than studying variation after variation. In any case, after C3, Polgar saw the possible danger of D4 and that opening of the position that will happen. She didn't want to allow White to get the control of the center, and neither she wanted to open up the position with that king in the middle and all those pieces behind. So Polgar did the move G5, which looked crazy, by the way. And yet, it's all about the idea of attacking the knight and eventually making D4 a little bad. So if d4, g4, she will challenge, she will challenge. So what would you do in this position yourself? It's a weird move, g5, and I'm not saying it's good. But the question, nevertheless, stands out to be, what do we do? How to play this position now with white? Take a moment and think about it yourself. Hmm. Think about that. This this is very interesting. Now, <clears throat> what what book is this? Uh, I think that my book has F5. I uh, beat it, Kaspar. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So, let's see. While you're thinking, let me actually. Um, no, don't put in. Don't put your email on the chat. I wouldn't email you if you put your email on the chat. Um, actually, I need you to send me an email. Send me an email. Uh, so, Valeri, this may seem a bit off topic, but is there a system that you recommend to play against the French defense? There are many. I like King C in an attack. I like the Knight D2 variation. I like the Knight C3 Bishop D2 line. If you know what these are, uh, you can look them up. They're pretty good. Um, okay, what is the variation of the Sicilian you're showing? It's called the Rosolimo or the Moscow. I'm not sure. Actually, I think that one of them is Rosolimo. I think Bishop against Bishop D7. The other one is Moscow. You excuse me. I'm really bad with names of openings. But either one of these, Rosolimo or Moscow. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think my book has F5, but I should look at G5. I think F5 and G5 suffer from the same sort of problem. You can't open if you are behind in development. If you do you are struggling to lose if your opponent knows how to handle it. Oh, oh boy, you know Kasparov did know very well how to handle that. So first thing, whenever you feel better, both in development or in preparation, open up the position. That is all that White wanted, all that he did. Absolutely, D4, thank you. That was a great suggestion. It doesn't matter that Black is fighting against this move. It doesn't matter at all. Just break. D4. After G4, White played knight after the D2, and this moment comes with the idea of a sacrifice, but it's a brilliant sacrifice because the truth is it doesn't matter. He could actually take, I think she took with the C pawn, it doesn't matter so much which pawn she take she took with. But then there's knight c4 attacking against the D5, the D4. And as black played c5, there was rook e1 lining up the rook instantly against the black king. And it was Wonderful. It was really strong. It was really great as it happened. So black plate now with the move of bishop to the e6, just getting that bishop right in and challenging. So now white developed. Knight beat a3, and there came the move of bishop e7. So let's talk about this position a little more. What should white do now? 
we've already gotten some development. The truth is that Black Skink is behind, and a lot of his pieces, too, don't have too much to do. But what is White's best way to go about this now? Take a moment and think. Yes, Russell Lima is with Bishop b5 and when there's a knight on c6. Thank you. That's a, that's a good comment. Yes, Moscow is with Bishop b5. Check. Like when Black doesn't play the knight c6. I, I wasn't sure of that. So e5, yes. Just the same pattern as before. He's behind in development. We break open and we make it work. This is great. With e5 on the line, now Black's got only one thing to do, which is d5. And this is the, the time, this is the moment where we're opening up brilliantly by playing knight d6 check. There is no way how he's going to survive this position if we open. And what's so interesting about that is that it's a concept that a lot of players do not know. It's a very basic concept, but but they don't know about it. It's what I mentioned in, initially when, I, when we first started, you know, that... Um, a lot of players are not familiar with those ideas on how to create possibilities. And Grandmaster Sam Shanklin, in his new course of 55 chapters, over 16 hours actually, of, of analyzing Grandmaster games and talking about how they think or how they actually you know, create those possibilities and follow them, he brings a lot of that up. So I do recommend you to check it out. It's it's a brilliant, brilliant course. And he talks about all these small things you could really utilize in your games uh, quite effectively. So in any case, right after that move of knight d6 check, uh, black has no way to take it because now after the exchange takes and then the queen takes the d, White's got b4, and then you can see it's not just the fact that black can't castle anytime soon, it's also the fact that we've got an opposite colored bishop sequence. An opposite colored bishop usually means that when the position opens, it's going to be devastating. So that was uh, terrific. Black, now Paul Gerd did the move of the king f8. Black just can't take. So what to do now? I'd like you to think about this moment and tell me of your suggestions on how why I should go about this position now. What's the best way to play here? Take a moment and think very carefully about it. Now, b4 or f4 or queen d2, I think so. Bo all of those moves work. And I think b4 is especially strong, so props for that. This is just what we talked about. Um, so uh, I want to know which variation of Sicilian do you recommend. Off topic, I like the Russell Limo and Moscow. I also like Grand Prix Attack. These are my favorites. Uh, it seems like g5 is not as good as f5 in this opening. Maybe. But either way, it's pretty important what white did. He didn't play b4. He didn't play any of those. What white did was bishop f4. And what's so interesting about that move is that in, instead of actually attacking, it rather maintains that pressure. So we can see that same pattern that worked in Kramnik's game, working in Kasparov's game, even though they were very different styles of play. Kasparov was known as a lot more aggressive and Kramnik a lot more positional. The same pattern works. You can't keep up with the attack for that long. You can't sustain it for that long. But if you can allow yourself to build up the pressure by bringing new pieces and more forces in line, you are going to be just great. So that now Black played the move H5 on his own. And this was the time where White played B4. So now the knight on the d6 isn't so much defended. What is defended is the square of d6. If black takes it, we're going to get an, a tremendous pass pawn over there. That is going to be more or less of a killer. And that's about it, really. Just we have everything in play. It was wonderful to play like that, and it's just great. So bishop f4 and then pawn to the b4. With a little bit of a delay, yet just enough. It's not slow because black couldn't do much, but we do it. So queen takes d4, h4, and then after that we have knight a to the b5 in this moment. And so you could realize a strength 
there is that night coming down towards C3 or maybe even towards the D4. And it is wonderful to just witness the power of white speeds is coming together. The most interesting part of all of this is that if you want to be really all that successful, uh, the, mo the, the thing that you need to do is just keep your pieces strong. That's all. Just keep your opponent in that, st in that structure, in that situation, and keep improving. It's not difficult to lead an attack. The problem is that most people make it so. They rely on calculation, on heavy analysis, instead of thinking about the simple rules, the rules that make an attack fundamentally strong. After the move of knight d4, black has absolutely nothing to do. And while somebody who's like loving tactics and say, where is the checkmate? Where is the big win? I say, you know, slow down. There's no checkmate. There's no win. And there isn't going to be one for a while. And before you say, ah, man, I want to see that. I want to see the checkmate. Before you do that, let me tell you that it's coming. It's just that the checkmate, the final combination, it comes at the end. So with that mindset, you can do a lot of things before that one single break really comes down. So now, what White did was just restrict. He moved away with his queen out of the black uh, possible pin. And as black attempted to, inv to invest in knight c6 and challenging the knight, White restricts with b5. Knight g6 and then knight c6 comes out. c3 and queen c1. I just wanted to look at the restriction that white is making. It is, it is simply brilliant to witness how effective that is. The most interesting thing is that there's no way of how black can play with his pieces. It's not that they can't move. I mean, some of them are having less squares, but it's just that they can't do anything. So now we're not talking so much about activity as we're talking about effectiveness of the pieces. The effectiveness is different because the effectiveness speaks of how much a piece can do. The problem is that black speeders just can't do anything. Not so much that they're passive. Well, he tried G3, you know, just to going for the exchange and some tactical things, I suppose, just to make things work. But uh, that was just not good. After the move of G3, how would you respond to that type of tactic? Let's see if you guys have any good suggestions. Now, one of you has said, see, I think that this was Judith's problem, uh, attempting things that were too aggressive against the best split. Players, Kasparov hands down was a way better attacker. Um, no, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Kasparov was the better attacker than anybody at that time. It's just that I think Polgar simply tried a new system in terms of just getting different possibilities, and she was very inventive like that, and it's it was good. It's just that this this one attempt did not turn out so so well. But when we talk about when you compare it to to your games and the games of the, that you're playing, oftentimes people will go this way not because they're prepared, but because they don't know the rules, they don't know the principles, they don't know what they're breaking. Then they don't even know the theory. They just play like that, and it's up to you to use these little things to punish them, like so. Uh, now, uh, okay, so one of you said. Too much harmony with the white pieces. I absolutely agree. This is truth. And, um, okay, I'm ready for bishop h6. Now, let's talk about that move. It looks like a fantastic move. But if you really think about it, it's losing. Because now, after bishop h6, king g8, I'm not talking that it's losing, like losing, generally losing the attack. It's losing the game. And it's losing the game because presently, there is the threat of knight xd5 and queen takes b 6 which will destroy the white harmony, so to speak. And the worst possible thing is that there is nothing white can do to fix that. Even if he takes the pawn, black would just play a move of f6 at this point. And we could see how with that pawn on e5 gone and the knight being threatened, the bishop on h6 hanging. Ouch, this is bad. So what the hell happened? It looks so good and then suddenly it's so bad? Yes. Because I call that uh, the concept of structural focus. And it's not only found in chess. You can find it in a lot of other areas. A lot of the things that look great and turn out bad, you know, if eventually, uh, is, 
are happening exactly because of that thing. We can put anything, stories, you know, like art, you know, like sport, other, other sports, you know. Some things start great and they don't end great. And the reason for that is because in 99% it's because of the concept of structural focus. So what does that concept mean? Well, I'm going to explain to you how that works in chess. So structural focus means that you start in one way with one idea. And what happens is that before you accomplish that idea, you jump and you focus on something completely different. <clears throat> so as a result, the tone changes and all the circumstances change, which could ruin something really beautiful. So the concept of structural focus suggests that unless you have already achieved the big advantage that you were looking for, and certainly White hasn't, you should stick to that major idea or that one thing that was making your game great. Presently, it's all about the center, the support to it, and the restriction over black speeds. If you play with and jump with the move of bishop h6, it pretty much brings the play to something completely different. And white's not ready for it. So this is why Kasparov actually made the, the very unimpressive f takes g3. In fact, out of, after all that active and aggressive play, he chose a very slow positional continuation just so that he can keep the pressure he was holding in the center and make sure that black is going to stay in the backside position for a little bit longer. It was beautifully played and it was effective. King g7 and queen takes to the c3. It was great. Even if black tried to play d4 to protect the pawn, that wouldn't have helped because then again, what the structural focus of white would have been on the right place and he'd be ready. This is how it works, and it's a very interesting idea. The concept of structural focus is related to another principle that I'm going to give you with the next game that we're going to talk about. But essentially, it is why great games end badly. Every single time, 99%, I mean, there is 1% that don't go with that because of that, that there are other reasons, like, you know, a variety of different other reasons, but 1% of those games ends and badly out of, out of starting well. In most of them, it's because we change our focus, and that's what causes mistakes. So White kept the focus, and even now he hasn't changed it. His goal is to simply restrict Black's pieces. The more this comes through, the easier it is. And now Black makes an attempt for contemplate, but because White is so strong, it doesn't really matter. An ampassant works. Black sets the queen. And white doesn't care. He plays f7, thereby forcing the black bishop to capture. So let's see if anybody could tell me what white's got to do. Now, we, we have all the space and all the open pieces and all the open lines, and yet black is threatening on the h2. He wants to take there and win. So what would you guys say that white should do now? What do you think? Hmm. Let's see. <clears throat> now, one of you said, okay, I got some suggestions. Let's see. What were these suggestions? <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. <laughs> good afternoon to you, too. So here we go. Let's see. So what should White do? Uh, it's, okay, um, it's reloading. I'm sorry. It's reloading. Um uh, okay, hold on. You got to wait for me for one second because the chat reloaded and it seems like I'm getting all the messages at once right now. So I can't see what you've had, what you had in mind. H3, uh, uh, you know, okay, so uh, yeah, H3, rookie 8. Well, rookie 8 is going to be taken. H3 is going to be taken too. And, uh, you know, I think, yeah, if, then it's not good. Mm -mm. Rookie 8 is going to take it. There's no way. Gage 3 is definitely not going to stop Black from taking and then killing with the Queen. So there's got to be something else. Just think about it. Not E7. Good point. Problem is, Black is just going to take on the E7 with the Knight. And then there's no way on how we can make it work. <clears throat> so no. 
damn, that looks such a good position. How does White spoil it like that? Queen c8 maybe? Uh, nope, because then he's going to take it with the knight. Knight d4 is a possibility to solidify. Yes, I agree. Although it doesn't change the fact that he's going to chase us around. And I think White's losing a little bit of his advantage there. But yes, I mean, if there's nothing else, I guess knight d4 could do. But come on. You could feel it, right? It's just so many of the pieces of White are brilliant and powerful. Now, you suggested... Okay, yeah, here you go. You're getting it now. This queen takes h8. And that was absolutely terrific. This move of queen takes h8 is actually pretty amazing because it seems like, like there's no defense, and then suddenly there's this move that as a result, if black plays queen takes h8, we see rook takes f7 happening, and the perfect, I'd say brilliant coordination of white's pieces makes all these threats possible. But it's not so much about because of that. It's the interesting part is that if black takes with the knight, as she did, white can do knight e7. And now if the king f8 and knight e to c8, it's still those brilliant attacking pieces that black cannot deal. The h2 threat is over, and white carries on a great weight with all of his upcoming pieces. As the game progressed and black played queen d3, white played rook f3, and so next move, black tried queen c2, and yet there was an exchange which helped white to take a third piece uh, in order, I mean, a second piece, in fact, to, to compensate the queen. The interesting thing about it is there is no value of the queen. I think it was Kasparov himself who used to say that every piece has its own relative value depending on the position. And the relative value of the queen was really small uh, in respect to what what really happens here. So the, the other pieces, white played rookie five, and I mean, exchange takes d4, king g1. Black tried to get active and make some complications, but it was a, it was just a matter, a matter of only a few moves. Even when that pawn advances so far, so much further, it doesn't change anything. White's extra two pawns are going to help us deliver, and uh, it's uh, it's winning. I'm just playing it very quickly, so you can see the bishop took the beautiful diagonal, and White just keeps on going. Now. It looked like Kasparov did this brilliant move of Queen takes H and he won. And I'm here to tell you it was great looking. But was that right? Truth is, it wasn't. It wasn't even half as good as it looks. <laughs> because however good and well prepared you are, you got to know one thing. When you're making a big break or a very committal move like that, you better think about or calculate about all the different circumstances, especially from your opponent's perspective. So we see the greatest player of all time basically making a mistake right now for one simple reason, looking at it from only one angle. Now, here's how that works. Now, it's a lot easier for me to say it when I'm analyzing than actually do it because, you know, if... if you imagine yourself playing against Kasparov or even you did Polgar, you're going to lose in 20 moves as well as I. But, you know, it's a lot easier to analyze it. But now we're, we're here to learn. And this is a concept that so many, I mean, every chess player suffers from that. I'd like to explain it in the following way. Imagine you're looking at a street and you are, let's say, in the west wing of your, of your house. So, like, you're looking at the street in one way. Now, you're going to see, you know, like the bus stop. You're going to see, you know, like maybe the store next to it. And you're going to see the trees and whatever. But imagine right now that you are of the opposite direction, you know, like say 200 for 500 yards. And you look at this at the same spot. Now, you're probably going to see a lot more because you're actually going to see your own house, and you're going to see, you know, what's next to it, and so on and so forth. You may even notice some holes or breaks in the road. You're going, what my point is, is that you're going to see it in a very different perspective. There are still going to be important similarities, but you're going to have a different sight. Now, 
the problem with a lot of the chess players who engage in sacrifices like that and actually fail is that they look at the position only from one angle, their own angle, their own perspective. What does that move give me and how do I kill him with that? That's their own perspective. And, and it's almost like you're already predisposed to choose it because you, you like it too much. This is why I often say you need to remember the point of perspective because point of perspective of you making that sacrifice helps you to see it in one way. But if you actually try to put yourself at your opponent's position through your opponent's shoes, you're going to start looking a little bit more at what he can do and you're going to start finding or evaluating different options in a lot better way. All that Paul got hard to do in this moment was the move of bishop c5. She did not see or do and the reality is that Kasparov's whole strategy would have been completely busted. Even the move of rook e8 check which looks great right now uh, just doesn't work because there are yes there is another check from e5 but in the end of the day that could be just the sacrifice and then after rook takes d5 queen to d3 i feel like the rooks <clears throat> are just not enough to stop the queen and the bishops that black is having it was so simple and yet why well, missed it in fact black missed it too and why did black miss it <laughs> Black missed it for another type of mistake. She reacted to the idea of, okay, knight c8 goes very close. I have to do something with my queen. You see, and that's another type of a problem. You know, thinking more about the reactionary type of, you know, the reaction that we're going to take instead of really figuring out what the problem is. The problem being that the pieces are too strong and, and Black had to fight against that knight and challenge them a little bit more. So in any case, that doesn't undermine the game because it's a really beautiful game. Mistakes like that always happen. It just shows us a few important things that we got to understand, a point of perspective and learning not to react towards what the opponent is doing, but rather to figure out the actual problem and what we can fight for that. In fact, it wasn't necessary at all for black to play like this. All that, I mean, for white to play, all that white wanted to, had to do was basically play either knight d4 or an even simpler move, bishop h4, which in this specific position would have handled the problem in a lot simpler and easier manner. Opening the road for the queen to defend h3, and despite the sacrifice of a bishop, it's not as big as a queen, yet black can defend the f7 bishop, and he can't do anything. Knight f4 now would be met by knight e7 check, and you can see that this wild position really isn't so wild after all. Black's king is going to have to move, and then white can continue with the with the, what everything check there. And uh, you know now we have knight d5 or whatever. It's just the rook's hanging and the king is hanging. Yeah, everything's hanging from black. So uh, what is so wonderful about this uh, about this position is how both players, the greatest strong man and the greatest woman chess players in the in, the, in that era, really missed something that a lot of other players are going to miss too. And that by now by no means suggests that the game was actually bad. On the contrary, it makes it great because seeing the flaws, even in the most perfect game, helps you to realize that there is no way to play a perfect game. There is always mistakes on both sides. It's just about who makes less. As Kasparov says, it's about making less mistakes than your opponent. But what really drives this game forward and what helped White to, to grow his position and make the strategy work out so well was actually this one thing that a lot of people miss. Now, if you really think about this, in most of the games of intermediate or beginner chess players, you're going to find out that the structural focus is always missing. And that means often they don't have a goal. Now, I want you to think about one idea. If you read through a book or you go to see a movie or a TV show that's boring, do you know why that is? In most of the time, you know, it's not because it's switching the tone of starting, you know, well and then going bad. It's kind of bad all the way through. And the reason is because there is no goal. You see things happen, you read things happen with no goal. That's how we often play chess. Now, the really great pieces have that one very simple pattern within, you know, embodied in them, you know, 
every single one of them, there is a major goal and there are obstacles, and then we actually walk towards the goal and we can identify with the, you know, with whatever it is, the story, for example. In chess, we need a goal. Now, we can change along the way, but we need to pursue something. Instead of just saying, oh, I got to calculate this, I got to do this, I got to maneuver that way. You know, you can do all these things, but you got to do it towards a specific goal. White's goal here was to make sure he constantly keeps the challenge and pressure over the Black King, and his goal was to open up the center. Very similar to the Kramny game that was out there, where well, ultimately all he wanted to do was gradually improve and build on the queen side. If you're ever wondering if you're going in the right direction with your game, ask yourself, okay, am I following a specific goal? That's a very simple question. But if you think of it, most chess players don't do it. Unless you're conscious of it, you're not going to do it. So you need to think, okay, what's the realistic goal I'm trying to follow in that case? White's goal was to maintain a strong pressure, and every single move or candidate that followed through it was actually helping that. So it was a great game, a lot of interesting moments, and I do hope that you learned as much as I did from it. Again, don't forget to check the 50% off uh, Grandmaster Sh Sam Shanklin's uh, uh, like brilliant course, on uh, you know on on actually at 16 hours uh, of chess trading, I think they're great. And if if you want me to send you these games with my annotations or whatever, please do send me a message or an email. Now uh, I just want to answer a few questions uh, that you've asked uh, while you're while you're actually figuring out maybe some other questions. Um, now one of you said. My question is, why are men rated higher than women? I think that the reason is because not that many women play chess in, com in comparison to, to, to men. That's probably the reason. Um, you know, uh, other than that, I, you know, there's no, there's no other reason. I think Polgar proved that women are just the strongest man in chess. So, uh, yeah, she defended like a champ. She played a really good game. So, um, okay, then um, think about how many men are playing. <laughs> no, this is fine. I think that it's not about that. It's just most interestingly, uh, if you have more women playing than men, you'd have the same comparison. However, women this time will be stronger than men. So it's more just about women playing more chess, and I think that's going to happen, so don't worry. Okay, so, yeah, and in any case, um, yeah, I, I like that, so you summarize the major goal here, see the, the major point of the lecture, specific goal, yes, you know, intention, goal, and obstacles, like, all right, how do we overcome the different things that, that are in the way? Every single good game has that. Every single good book has it. Every single good movie has it. Well, music, not so much. But, you know, think about that. All right. And uh, one of the ideas is, uh, like, that White followed it through the whole game. One thing. And he never failed. He never lost his structural focus. And he was very successful. So thank you all for joining me tonight. Again, I'm going to have the next webinar on the coming uh, Saturday, next Saturday at the usual time. If any of you wants me to send you this, these games, just send me an email to valeria.lilov at gmail.com or maybe just visit my website, which is tigerloft.com. Thank you all for joining me tonight. And don't forget to check out the Grandmaster Sam Shanklin scores 50% off just right below the video. Have a good time and enjoy the weekend.